Beans and Breakdowns, a podcast dedicated to bridging the gap between specialty coffee and the heavy music community. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by John Chandler of Perk Coffee. Perk Coffee is located in my hometown of Savannah, Georgia, and was one of the first, if not only, specialty coffee roaster that was present in Savannah when it was founded in 2010. So John was nice enough to come on and share about what he does at Perk Coffee, as well as talk about some metal music with me. So grab a fresh cup of coffee and wake the fuck up! How's it going, caffeinated crew? I have such a special treat for you guys today. I'm here with John Chandler from Perk Coffee in my hometown of Savannah, Georgia. John, welcome. How are you doing today? Yeah, thanks so much. I'm doing well. It's a nice, steamy, (laughs) post-rain evening in Savannah. So just a normal day in Savannah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So we're, we're uh, we're talking about coffee. We're talking about, you know, heavy music. What are you drinking on your side of the uh, the television? Oh, uh, currently, today, I have this uh, nice Ethiopia. Um, It's our uh, washed option, the Halo Hartume, I believe is how you um, you say it. Um, Get a lot of like nice peach and jasmine notes, little fruitiness, little floral notes. Um, Super good. you know, I kind of like like those a lot. They work well on espresso. Um, I mean, a lot of people might not think that, but it's really, really cool when you pull a shot of espresso and you get like a lot of like jasmine notes and stuff like that. And it's just, it's a totally different shot. And, you know, I kind of really love it. Yeah, for sure. I'm a, I'm a sucker for the Ethiopian uh, espressos. Yeah, they're, not, yeah. they're not super popular up here, but I I, I really love that uh, super rounded, like floral jasmine when it comes through. It's not as, um, you know, chocolatey and sweet, but it's very right. complex, which I like. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes it a little more interesting. Definitely. Uh, I have on my side, I've got the, it's the single origin of the month, I believe, from Perk. Mm-hmm. It's Tanzania. I don't remember the name of the farm and it's not on the bag. Uh, But it is washed. (laughs) I do know that it's washed. Um, And the notes on the bag are nectarine and dark chocolate. I am definitely getting some of that citrus, but not the, it's more of a sweet citrus. So that nectarine, not too sour from like a lime or lemon perspective, Um, but definitely a nice earthy chocolate finish on it. Um, But yeah, definitely a lot of those good, you know, balanced citrus notes in there. Yeah. Yeah. That one's been good. Um, I don't know how long we'll have that one around, but it's, you know, I really enjoy that one as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, kind of a little, a little similar to like Ethiopia in a way where you get those little citrus notes, but not, it's really well balanced. Um, I find that you tend not to get super, you know, floral, like flowery taste. Like you definitely don't get the jasmine. You definitely don't get, um, it, it tends to be on the side of a stone fruit most of the time I feel like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really like that. Yeah, me too. We, we, uh, I, I really love, um, like Burundi and Kenyan coffee, mm-hmm. but, oh, but it's, Kenyans. yeah, it, it's really hard to track down, uh, especially certain times of the year here in Montreal. Mm-hmm. Um, but whenever I can get my hands, you know, I snatch it up. Like it's, yeah. Hard. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think I'm assuming I can, say this it'll be a little secret but uh we were sourcing a kenya soon mm-hmm. yeah it's been a minute and um so hopefully uh we get this one in pretty soon um i'm really excited about it because i'm a sucker for a good kenya as well oh yeah it's just i don't even really know how to it's definitely a lot earthier i would say than mm-hmm. you know the the ethiopian and even the tanzania but it's it's just got like a good like i love the afternoon I, I usually tend to go more for like an Ethiopian or African coffee and the Kenyan really mellows me out in the afternoon. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But you still get those nice kind of stone fruity notes definitely um, from them, but it's just really, really chill. Some peach, even sometimes you'll get like, a, yeah. and I know one, one roaster here, they had a, it was like a Kenyan 
may have been a Burundi, but I think it was Kenyan and they had cream soda like notes in it. And it was definitely nice. like almost like a sweet, creamy note. It was super strange, but it worked. It was really, really good. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I'm always a sucker for a good Kenya. So oh, yeah. I need to hunt down some more until we get ours in. So on the same note as coffee, which just coffee in general, but uh, what was your introduction to specialty coffee? Um, it was, uh, geez, probably 12, 12 or 13 years ago, probably. Um, there was a coffee roaster in Griffin, Georgia, kind of close to Locust Grove. I don't know if you're too familiar with that. Yep. Um, but uh, Safe House Coffee in Griffin, Georgia. Um, they kind of introduced me. It was probably like 20 minutes from where I was living at the time. Um, but it was really the only specialty coffee anywhere outside of Atlanta. Um, you know, so we would, we'd go there at least once a week, you know, grab a, a usually like a latte and one of their brownies and stuff. And I'm just like, Oh, this is so good. And we always sat at the bar, chatted with the, um, with the barista. And, um, one day he was like, Hey, I want you to try this coffee. It's like, you don't have to pay for it. You don't even have to like it. You just need to try this. And it was a natural Ethiopia. And, um, you know, of course. So he ground it and started brewing it up, like doing a pour over, like right in front of us. And it, you could just smell like it was a blueberry explosion. And I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. And like, it was nothing like I'd ever tasted before. And uh, yeah, that just, that got me hooked. And so quickly got away from my lattes and to, you know, doing the pour overs and like scaling down to like just a cappuccino, you know, and just like, I was like, Oh no, here we go. So, so that was uh, kind of my start was uh, at safe house in Griffin. They had super cool people and I still uh, keep in touch with some of them uh, that used to be there. They're, you know, off in other shops now. And and you do for perk, you do a lot of the brew guides from what I've noticed. Yeah. Um, I don't really write them. Um, I usually leave that up to, um, like Philip will do it along with Taylor and Bradley, our roaster, like Taylor and Bradley uh, do all of our roasting and sourcing. Um, and then we bring in like our, um, our cafe manager, Jesh, um, you know, so they'll all go together and start cupping and tasting everything, working up all the tasting notes and everything and trying to communicate that like from directly from the roaster to our shop in Savannah and then also the shops in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, just trying to, you know, also get feedback mm -hmm. uh, from the other shops, be like, Hey, what are y'all tasting? We know your, your water's different. You know, so there's a little difference in like trying to make sure the talk and the coffee tastes great, like across the board. Um, but yeah, they, they do most of that writing and, um, you know, all of the information for that. In terms of your kind of career in coffee, was Perk your introduction to working in the industry? Uh, uh, I mean, yes, unless you want to count Starbucks. You know, if you want to count, like, everybody starts, everybody starts at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was like, I don't know, like a six month stint at Starbucks where I didn't even drink coffee. Right. Like I just worked there and they're like, all right, now we got to go through and fill out our little paperwork and you have to taste all the coffees. And all of my notes were, this tastes like burnt dirt. This tastes like burnt green beans. This, this tastes like burnt mud. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I didn't even drink coffee then, but I guess that's, you know, I guess that was technically my start in coffee. Yes. I, I was watching a, um, it was like a coffee blog or something. And a, a guy basically said, we owe Starbucks a debt of gratitude for basically giving us all third wave baristas. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're the launching pad for third wave culture in the U S which I do agree. But at yeah. the same time, uh, it's it's hard to drink sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, if you get like enough cream and sugar and maybe like a donut or something to go with it, you can you can make it through. Just get the donut, you know, particles floating in the coffee enough to exactly. You're just chewing it. Yeah. 
Or, you know, if you just go at it, just realizing I want a hot, sweet drink. That's the I'm going to get a hot, sweet drink. I'm I'll not take an, thinking about coffee. I'll take an ice mocha with an extra pump of mocha. And then exactly. you're good. Yeah, exactly. So you've been a part of the Perk crew. You guys call it the Wrecking Crew, which is really cool. Since uh, yeah. since 2015. <laughs> what was your launching pad into to Perk Coffee? Um, I mean, I had, uh, my wife and I would come down to Savannah um, on vacation every year. Um, she moved down here um, before we got married. She was living down here for a couple of years and uh, moved back to Metro Atlanta. We ended up getting married. So we had, you know, she had friends down here. So we would just visit them every year. And, um, you know, we would just walk around the city, just downtown and grab coffee and kept seeing like perk at all these shops. And I was like, oh, this is good. And uh, when we moved down here, I looked up on their website. They were, um, at the time, they were doing the cuppings, like the public cuppings, so you could go show up on Friday and just talk about coffee. And uh, so I started, you know, going um, because when we moved down here, I I didn't have a job yet. Um, my wife had got a job. And uh, so I was like, I'm very available right now. You know, so I'm going to go check out this, uh, you know, this coffee shop or coffee roaster at the time. And um, yeah, they were super cool. Uh, just walked in. Taylor was there. Um, I was like, am I supposed to be here? He was like, yeah, you can come in. Just kind of showed me around, showed me all the beans and everything. And, uh, you know, I just kept going um, a couple of times. Um, you know, I probably went two or three times before I ran into Philip. And uh, he asked what I was doing. And I said, well, I'm looking for work. And he, he was like, oh, good, because we're looking to hire somebody. It's like, awesome. So, um, yeah, I just started out, uh, you know, packing beans and making deliveries. And that's, that's how I kind of, you know, got into working at Pert. Um, But it was really just like seeing them around the city and seeing the coffee and like tasting it and, you know, uh, it was, I guess, 2014, I guess Christmas 2014, um, my wife got me a bag of the Mexico that they had. It was one of their limited runs that they did, and it was amazing. Um, and I still think about that coffee. It was delicious. <laughs> Tasted like baked apples and cinnamon, and I'll never forget it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I remember exactly which coffee that was because Foxy had yeah. it on uh, their single origin for that that winter holiday season. Yeah, yeah, so nice. I don't remember the name, but I remember it was amazing. I can't. I I believe it was from Oaxaca or something like that. It may have been. Yeah, it was delicious. Yeah, that, I love that that you just kind of showed up and said, "I'm looking for work." Yeah, <laughs> that, those are always the best jobs to get. You just make yeah. yourself a part of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, it, it just kind of worked from like part-time into full-time into what it is now. And do you have a background in photography? Is that kind of how you took <clears throat> over a lot of the marketing side of it? Yeah. Um, I mean, not like a, not like a, like a schooling or anything, but I just picked it up. Um, I've always enjoyed it. Um, I have a couple of friends that went to uh, school for photography and I would, you know, assist them with weddings and other shoots and stuff and, you know, lug their gear everywhere. And, um, but also just, you know, go out and shoot with them. And, um, you know, so I've, I've been interested in photography for, you know, since I was a kid, um, my dad did some, you know, photography and I get his old like film camera and shoot and stuff. Um, which was awesome when we were on vacation and I, you know, went out to photograph the sunrise and shot a whole roll and then realized there was no film in the camera. <laughs> so got up at 5am and drove to the beach and I was like, Oh, well, at least I saw it. You yeah. Know, I saw the sunrise. That was it's cool. In your, it's in your brain forever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that, that is in my brain forever. And I never, I always double check and make sure I've got film now. <laughs> That's it. The lesson that you learn is, always check yeah yeah but yeah i mean it was like it's uh just an interest in photography and then you know at the time um they didn't really have anybody doing uh that um you know so i just kind of started doing it 
and, you know, making, you know, intentionally trying to connect with people and just putting our information and photos and, you know, everything out there to the world, um, you know, just kind of building it that way. Yeah, I, I love the website. I've been checking it out and going through all of the news and blogs and everything. And, you know, it's got such a great vibe and everything like that. And the photos look really great. So Nice. We love to hear it. Yeah. Uh, the single origin project is something that I'm you know, really stoked about that you guys have been doing since 2019 now. Um, mm-hmm. But working with a, a farm or a kind of a lot around the world every month to showcase, you know, a small producer of coffee. Could you walk through the process of the sourcing all the way to the roast? Um, yeah. I mean, as far as I know, um, like I said, I'm not too involved in a lot of the sourcing. Um, when, they, when they are roasting and doing their sample roasts of, uh, you know, all the coffees that are coming um, for that season, um, you know, they'll get everybody together and do a cupping and we'll all taste all the coffees and then talk about them, see which ones we liked, which ones we disliked, you know, and why. And then, um, you know, some of them, they, you know, they're looking a little bit more, um, you know, some coffees are like super interesting. Um, Like we got um, a Yemen coffee uh, a while back and that was, you know, that's, really hard to get a hold of um, but it was also super delicious mm-hmm. and um you know it was just you know kind of a cool story of that of that area and uh what they're working through um just to like produce great coffee you know on top of like all the struggles and everything they go through you know day to day um but uh yeah i mean a lot of them you know they're they're just looking for, um, you know, like something that kind of fits in. Um, we everything we do is more of like the medium to light range, right? And uh, you know, we've always got like a washed Ethiopia, natural Ethiopia, um, you know, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, usually. Um, then we've got some, you know, leave some room for some crazy things like you know Kenyas or, you know, like a natural Colombia. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and things like that. Um, you know, and some of the coffees I know that they, um, that they'll source, um, they'll make, you know, one of the roasters may have a connection with, you know, somebody at a farm or an importer that they know and they'll reach out to them. So it's just really like communicating with these people and just working with, you know, cool people that are trying to, you know, present coffee well and, um, you know, just make sure that, you know, it's treated, you know, well on, on both sides and just kind of down the chain, like up and down the chain that everything is done well and, and done right. Right. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what we're looking for. So the sourcing is more on the kind of calling on just connections or are there some farms that you guys regularly work with and then some that you specially work with importers? Because I know the Yemen one is probably definitely an importer, you know, working with a farm over there. Right. Yeah. And a lot of them are um, mostly importers and connections with importers, but I do believe that there's, um, you know, like I said, probably Taylor or Bradley would know um, a bit more about that. But, um, but yeah, some of them, uh, I know that they've talked to farmers and stuff, um, you know, directly, but a lot of it is from importers, um, you know, who have a really good reputation with these farmers um, and just the importing and exporting um, that makes, I think, the, the process a lot smoother, um, you know, because I, I can't imagine like trying to like navigate that much stuff coming from overseas and, you know, making sure it gets here on time and in one piece. Right. Yeah, that's quite an undertaking. Yeah. I love the the idea of getting a coffee from Yemen. I think it completely encapsulates what the specialty coffee industry really stands for is, you know, not just drinking a cup of coffee and drinking it for what it is, but knowing the history of, you know, who grew this coffee, what farm did it come from? What are they going through on a regular basis kind of? And I, I just love the idea of you guys being able to source a coffee from such a, a turbulent area and be able to support 
you know, the local economy there and present it to a community that would not probably in their normal day to day think about, you know, something coming from Yemen and what are those people going through regularly to have this coffee, you know, shipped to a completely different place on the other side of the world. I think that's such a, like a beautiful um, aspect of the specialty coffee industry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that one was, uh, was super cool because there was, um, you know, a little, a little more backstory than you usually get with a lot of coffees and, um, you know, just being able to, you know, trace that and just see, um, what they're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. And, um, you know, some coffees are a little more traceable than others. Um, you know, that one was super cool because of that. Um, and just being able to showcase that and, you know, tell that story, like you said, to, you know, to a group of people or to like, you know, a majority of people that don't even know, you know, what's going on. They're like, oh yeah, I like coffee. Um, but then to be able to like open them up to a little bit more about, um, you know, like, yeah, well, you like coffee, but also, you know, this is where it's from. These are what these people are dealing with. And then, you know, for us also like being able to showcase that and show, you know, present the, the work that these people have done, because, you know, I mean, what we do is, is part of that. Um, but it's not, it's definitely not all of it. It's like the very, almost the last bit of it. I mean, the last bit is like the person brewing it and serving it, you know, that, that, that has to be done well so that you can tell the story of everybody, you know, prior to, you know, and all the farmers and and importers and, you know, everybody it's, if they're doing all of this hard work, you know, we want to respect that and we want to show, you know, showcase what they've done and what they've achieved. And, uh, that's why most of our stuff is more of like, you know, medium to light roast, um, trying to roast it where it tastes amazing, Mm -hmm. um, and not really getting in the way of it too much. Just letting the coffee like talk for itself. Right. Just being able to taste the bean for what it is and not adding a bunch of the sweetness or caramel that you would get from like an over roast almost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's very important to have each hand in the process, having that, you know, equal amount of great care all the way up to it being in the cup is is such an important thing that I feel like people don't spend a lot of time thinking about. So I, I love that you guys are, you know, kind of forerunners in that, especially in the Savannah uh, area and in Georgia in general. But it's just really awesome to hear that from you guys. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, that's what we're trying to do is just like source, you know, great coffee from, you know, great people and, you know, kind of showcase them, um, you know, by not, not getting in the way, you know. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now. Uh, we're going to switch into the the music. I just kind of want to know what your, your daily driver playlist is. Oh man, that, that varies so, so much. <laughs> I mean, it could be anything. Um, but since we're on beans and breakdowns, we're going to stick with metal. Yes. And, uh, uh, first of all, I have to represent my friend, uh, Joseph Calero picks off the cliff. Um, he's out in LA, uh, doing, doing the metal scene. Um, well, he kind of plays in like everything, but this, uh, this project is, uh, basically him. And, um, you know, it's really, really good. Uh, the album is, did I, no. Oh yeah. It's on my shirt. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The album is, uh, regression and, um, it's on Spotify. If you want to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Super heavy stuff. Is it like um, it looks like it would be a doom metal band just from the look of the shirt. Uh kind of. I mean, it's not like super sludgy. Um, okay. it's it's a little more like death metal. Okay. Um, you know, got like the the squeals and the growling and you know, all of that. And he uh he's pretty like stupid talented. Like he did all the work on it. Um and he's a producer as well. And you know, so he does a lot of work for bands in town as you know, out there in LA as well. Um, but yeah, super good. If you want to check it out. I'll definitely check that out. I'm always looking for some new, uh, death metal stuff to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, besides that, I mean, I guess really this last year, uh, 
Cattle Decapitation's Death Atlas has been like the perfect album for like <laughs> the whole last year. <laughs> it's just uh, uh, like the idea of hopelessness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, also, yeah, I mean, I guess so. But I don't know. People think I'm weird when I listen to metal. That oh, that's so like gross and death, and no, I'm like, no, it's so nice and relaxing. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm such a weird person, but oh, no, it's it's relaxing in a sense because of the rhythmic, like the dynamics and the rhythms, and you get into like a groove listening to it. It can be either yeah. really aggressive and fire you up, or it can be super relaxing. Like my wife will listen to Code Orange or like Zabalba and fall asleep. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, you know, um, sun, I guess is really good to like fall asleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, just cause it's like this, like one massive note for half an hour. <laughs> well, we were, I was in the um, studio last week and sleep, we were talking about sleep has that hour long song. Yeah. And it's just like, I guess for meditation, if you want to do that, that'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, I've also listened to like Meshuga and just gone to sleep and just like, ah, just like this constant rhythm and like all this crazy stuff. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, that's pretty much like my go tos. If I don't want to think about, if I just want to pick something, I'd probably pick, you know, one of those three and just go to town. Oh, yeah. <laughs> are there any shows coming up that that you're looking forward to going to uh i don't know i mean it's been so long since i've been to a show i've got to actually get out and see like you know what's here um i know my sugar was in jacksonville i think last year or a couple of years ago now mm-hmm. uh, i missed that um just because i didn't have it was the wrong time um i wasn't able to make it down which i'm kind of kicking myself for but um i would definitely see them if they come again you know anytime in the near future definitely well i really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me about uh your journey in coffee your music tastes i just have one last question for you what is your favorite city for beans and breakdowns oh well i'm probably gonna have to go with um I mean, I'll say LA. Um, it's been ages since I've been out there, but I, I still know people out there in, in both scenes. Um, you know, and it, it seems like there's still really good stuff going out there, um, you know, with, uh, with the music and uh, coffee. Absolutely. So I'm going to go with LA and hopefully I get it back out there soon. Was there a, a coffee shop in LA that you really enjoyed last time you were there? Um, no, sadly, when I did go, um, I didn't get to any coffee shops. Like I was on a, a schedule with a few other people. Um, they weren't really into coffee. And so I got dragged around to like malls. And the closest thing yeah. I got to was a Starbucks. But I know that good coffee exists out there. Like I said, I've got mm-hmm. friends and you know out there that are... So it's, it, it'll be on my, my list for next time. For sure. Which hopefully is soon. Yes, hopefully. I'm hoping to get out there soon again, too. Last time I was there, I got to try Coffee Commissary and Go Get Them Tiger, which Go Get Them Tiger okay, yeah. is great, like really, really good. And then from San Fran, they've kind of moseyed down the um, to the southern area. It's uh, is it Verve. Yeah, Verve. Um, I want to check that out. And I actually worked with a guy that used to work at Minotti's out there. Mm-hmm. So um, Verve is really exploding, um, especially so that they opened a new train station in Japan and they, oh, nice. they actually picked Verve to open a roastery. They brought people from like San Fran and got all the equipment, everything brought to Japan for them to open a shop in the train station. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's really cool. The, the coffee scene in LA is definitely uh, worth the visit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so hopefully I'll get out there soon, do that, meet up with my friends, and hit up some shows as well. Hell yeah. The LA scene is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're wild. So, well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and hanging out with me, talk about coffee and music and make me feel homesick about Savannah. 
I hope you uh, take care. Hope everything goes well with Perk with all the projects you'll have coming up. Yeah, I appreciated it. Thanks for having me on and uh, always good to chat. We'll take care. All right, thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beans and Breakdowns. I'd like to say a special thanks to John for coming on the podcast, sharing all of the details of what's going on at Perk, his experience in coffee, and especially what he's been listening to. You can check out Perk Coffee in store if you're in the Atlanta or Savannah area, or you can go to perkcoffee.com to find out what roasts they're doing. You can read on their blog about the single origin project like I talked about with John a bit. Uh, A lot of great brew guides, all kinds of interesting stuff if you're into learning more about coffee. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Also, you can find us on the web at beansandbreakdowns.com and on Instagram at beansandbreakdowns where you can find out who the guests are, what the coffee of the week is, and what we're listening to during the week to prepare for the interview. Until next week, be sure to stay caffeinated and wake the fuck up.